Welcome back to The Road to 2000. As always, uh, my name is Caleb Denby, and I will be your driver on this journey. What I wanted to talk about tonight is actually uh, planning in chess. The first couple of lectures, I went over uh, tactics, tactical motifs, how to find them in your games. And I think a lot of people, what they struggle with next is, how do I get there? How do I get to positions where I have tactics, where I can win material, where I can win the game? So what I wanted to do today is talk a little bit about planning. Uh, so planning is something that really comes about mostly in closed structures. Uh, there are a few different types of centers in chess, and they kind of determine the way that the, the play will, will go. So again, what I want to talk about today is a closed center. So what, what do I mean by that? Uh, basically, what a closed center is, is when all of these center pawns are locked together. So they can't really move. Uh, it's going to stay shut for most of the game. And uh, you're going to have to find a way to play on the flanks. So I'm sure you guys have seen this pawn structure before. What opening would this maybe arise out of? King's yeah, it's, it's like a King's Indian structure. So you can imagine you know, black has a bishop here. White's pieces are kind of developed uh, in some manner like this. And uh, we'll take a look at that momentarily. So this is one type of closed center. You can get this position from the King's Indian defense. Uh, you can probably transpose into it uh, a couple different ways, maybe from the Peerts. But uh, it's one of the closed center positions. So we're going to look at a couple games in this. And then I also want to look at this structure today. So what type of structure is this, right? What openings does, does this come out of? Yeah, a French or a Caro. Well, not a Caro with, with uh, this pawn still on the board. But uh, you can transpose into you know, some Caro positions after something like c5, c3, takes, takes. So these are kind of uh, two really common structures that show up in a variety of openings, one being the French, uh, the other being you know, the Caro. You can get these types of positions, positions in the Caro, and the piece placement will just be slightly different. So what should you look for in both of these positions. The plans that each side has are actually very similar in both of these closed center positions. What do you try to do in general? Play on the flank where you have space advantage. Yeah, you want to play on the side where you have more space. Or uh, sometimes it's phrased, play where your pawns point. So white's pawns are pointing you know, to the king's side. Black's pawns are pointing to the queen's side. So white's going to try to find play on the king's side, usually. And black's going to try to find play on the queen's side. And it's just the opposite here. Here, white has more space on uh, the queen side. So that's where he'll try to play. And black has more space on the king side. So I wanted to show you a game that I played uh, just a little bit ago against, uh, actually, Julian Perleko, who's kind of famous on the YouTube channel. Some of you may know him. Uh, and then I wanted to show you a game that uh, some 2400s played and what the differences kind of were be between our games. So this was a game in the King's Indian, so we're going to see that first structure again. And let's see uh, how it went. You know, Maybe black went wrong somewhere, and we'll try to figure out why white ended up winning, or in this case, me. What was the time control? Uh, it was uh, standard time control. I, I believe it was in uh, the Monday Night Strong Swiss when that was still happening. I think Julian played in one of those, and I got paired up with him. So d4, knight f6, c4, g6. Uh, knight c3, bishop g7, e4, d6. So this is the standard King's Indian. Uh, this is the you know the orthodox variation. Some will say. So you can see how we've arrived already at this same pawn structure that we looked at up here, right? It's exactly the same. Um, so again, white's going to play uh, on the side where he has more space, meaning the queen side, and black's going to play on the side where he has more space, meaning the king's side. So uh, with that in mind, uh, what do you think uh, our next few moves are going to be? What am I going to be playing for? Yeah, I'm going to be playing for you know eventually the c5 break. There are a few ways to do it. One popular way is you know the bayonet with uh, b4, or you know the the old way of doing it where you try to play c5 without b4. And similarly, what is black going to be playing for? Knight h5 followed by f5. Yeah. Yeah, some way getting this knight out of, out, of, uh, out of the way and then playing f5, right? So white plays on the side where he has more space, and this shows up specifically in this c5 breakthrough, you know, attacking the base of the pawn chain. And black plays on the side where he has more space, and this you know, uh, shows itself in the f5 breakthrough. 
So uh, with that in mind, I know Black's going to attack my e-pawn, so I'm going to play knight e1 here. And the point of this is kind of twofold, right? I'm preparing to defend my pawn with f3, and I'm preventing this knight from jumping into any good squares. So because of this, Black really wants to play f5 anyways, so he plays knight to d7, getting the knight out of the way. Another move here for Black is simply knight to e8, uh, with the same idea of playing f5. I develop my bishop, again, aimed at the same plan. Black plays f5, f3, and now f4. So Black realizes my pawn is you know, adequately defended, so he just gains even more space on the king's side. And now, what do you think is his next pawn break? Is his next pawn break is going to be, excuse me. So I'll move my bishop. And now, uh, now what should black, black be playing for? Has he just gained his space over here and now he's done? Or is, you know, is there another, another step to come? Well, you have a look there. Uh, but g5, g4, obviously. Yeah, so g5. Well, g5, h5, g4 sometimes. G5 and, and g4, right? G4 is now the pawn break that, that black is paying for. So this is kind of what I wanted to show in these close center positions. So you know, more generally, yes, you want to play on the side where you have more space. But uh, in most of these openings, that's going to rely on a single pawn break. And you know, if you can make that pawn break, then your position is very good. If you can't get that pawn break through, then your position is going to have some, some problems. Uh, so again, you really want to focus all of your play towards these pawn breaks. Uh, every move you make should be with the purpose. Uh, either the purpose of advancing your own plan, or preventing your opponent's plan, or ideally, some combination of the both. With that in mind, black played g5, you know, advancing his plan. He's getting ready to, to try to play this. My pieces are kind of set up right now to prevent this, as well as, you know, even support my own play on the queen side. So these two pieces are pretty well placed, uh, because, you know, they prevent my opponent's plan and they support my own plan. This bishop is well placed. It supports my c5 break. Uh, this knight uh, is, you know, it's on an okay square, but I can't really improve it right now. So, with that in mind, what do you think the main moves here actually are? Knowing that these pieces all can't really be improved, would you say? Knight to d3. Yeah. So knight to d3. This is a, a very common move in this opening. You simply defend the c5 square and you know, prepare to get this pawn break through. Um, so that, that you know, improves this piece. In the game, I actually chose to improve my rook instead of my knight. So I played rook to c1. Uh, black plays knight to g6 here, which is you know, a very common move. He's bringing more pieces over to support you know, this uh, advance on the king's side. Um, and now I play c5. So what do you think about this move? Just at first glance. Is there a reason you did this right away instead of playing b4 first and then c5? Um, yeah, so there's a reason to play it now instead of supporting it more. Uh, b4 isn't actually the best way to support it. If you want to support the break uh, you know, more thoroughly before you do it, the way to do it is with knight d3, actually. The problem with b4 is this a5 move actually becomes quite good when it's kind of awkward to defend this pawn. You can play a3, but uh, maybe you know, opening up the rook eventually isn't going to be so pleasant. So yeah, actually, the, uh, you know, slightly earlier on when white was playing the system, knight d3 was almost always the move, I believe. Uh, this was the most commonly played. But uh, lately these days, this rook c1 and uh, c5 right away has gained popularity. And it doesn't make a whole lot of sense at first, right? Because you know, black can simply capture this pawn. So would you agree that you know, unless there's a very important reason that we, we played this right away, uh, you know, this doesn't make any sense at all? Yeah. Yeah, right? <laughs> right, I mean, it kind of just looks absurd at first. Um, because you know this, we've I've just talked up this point, this point, this point. You know I gotta be playing for c5 so I can take on d6 so I can rip it open. But uh, the thing is, c5 isn't actually uh, yes, it's aimed at you know activating my own pieces where I have more space. But the main point of this move is actually to prevent Black's plan for as long as possible. Why would that be? How can that be the case? 
No, Black Knight wants to look at six to eventually support G4 and get his point the other way. Is the other point that C7 becomes a little bit weak, so if you play like E4 and then like Queen C2, is that C7 could potentially be a target? Or is that yeah, thing? that's exactly right. Okay. So um, yeah, the first thing you mentioned was, of course, let's say I do nothing. Um, let's just say I pass for some reason. Black would love to have this knight on f6. It puts pressure on this e pawn, and it supports this g4 break. f6 is like the ideal square for, th for this knight. Um, so the first thing it does is it draws this knight away from f6, where it would like to be. Then the second part you mentioned is uh, it makes the c7 pawn quite weak, actually, because we've put our rook here, and now we've opened this file. Uh, so there's going to be some serious problems for Black on, on this C7 pawn, unless he you know, deals with it pretty immediately. And because of that, we can actually draw this knight even further away with this move b4. So now what would happen on knight to d7? Yeah, knight to d7, knight b5, and this game's actually almost completely over. Black is dead lost here. Um, partially because I'm threatening to actually win this rook by force. Uh, if he just continues with his plan, as he would like to do, uh, simply knight c7, rook b8, bishop a7, and there's no way to save this piece. So this would be horrible for black. Um, because of that, black actually has to play knight to a6 here. So now, you know, the pawn sacrifice kind of makes a lot more sense. Uh, we've given up our c pawn, yes, uh, but we've given ourselves a target and we've managed to horribly misplace Black's knight. Now it's going to be much, much more difficult for Black to get this g4 move in. Um, where he takes the, the d pawn. Yeah, so d takes c5 isn't actually uh, you know, so popular here. Uh, I don't think uh, this has ever been played at, at a very high level. Uh, I don't know the specific lines uh, to refute it right away. You get the feeling it might just be something like knight to d3. Uh, maybe b6. b4 right away feels kind of like a bit much, but uh, I'm not sure what a, what a better move might be. Hmm. Maybe b4. Would it make sense to play bishop c4 first before knight b3 or not? I don't know about that bishop c4 move, because again, like I said, this bishop is actually well placed, because uh -huh. it, it does really you know, put a thorn in black's side with stopping this g4 break. But yeah, bishop c4 does make some sense setting up some threats, but maybe just king h8 would be fine, and then you know g4 is coming all the, well, all the quicker. Well, g4 will probably come regardless if black plays knight f6, pawn h5, then like... Well, that's the thing. It's, it's not it so easy. Time. You know, I can play this h3 move and stall for a bit. Maybe this b4 move isn't, isn't so bad. Uh, I'm not entirely sure, though. I'm not sure. I'm going to ask the engine really quick. So yeah, it thinks b4 or, or knight d3, b6, yeah, b4 is actually just strong. c4, knight b2, and I'm just winning my pawn back. Uh, so this does get your knight back into play, but now I've you know, no longer given up the pawn. I can recapture, and uh, you still can't play g4 right away. You still have to like, prepare it a little bit. <clears throat> so this move isn't, isn't so great for black, but uh, it is you know, an important idea. But uh, you know, knight c5 is the main move. It's, it's what most people play. Uh, again, this b4 idea, driving the knight to a6. And now I simply play knight to d3, uh, defending this pawn, uh, supporting this c5 square, which although I don't have a pawn to break through anymore, it's still important. And uh, you know, just developing my knight, improving my pieces. So rook to f7 was played, uh, adding another defender here, and maybe preparing to you know, support uh, his pawn break. So again, every move that you see <clears throat> is with the purpose, right? It's with the purpose of advancing my plan and you know, stopping my opponent's plan. And that's the way uh, you know, it, it should be in these closed types of positions. You really have to play with a purpose. That's, that's the only way I can phrase it. Uh, so rook f7, I play knight to b5. Uh, this now puts pressure on black's queen side, and it's actually causing some very uncomfortable problems for him. Um, in a few games, this move b6 has actually been tried to save this pawn. But uh, historically, this actually hasn't gone quite so well for black. Uh, Wesley So actually had a very nice game where he uh, you know, eventually broke through like this. He just piled up on the c pawn, I think, played something like rook to c3 and queen to c2. And uh, he managed to break through. 
So b6 is an option here, but uh, you know, it's not so popular because it does give up a lot of time, right? This is a full move solely dedicated to slowing me down, and it doesn't do anything to help advance black's plan, which is you know, the main idea. So instead of that, uh, bishop to d7 is played. Uh, this move uh, is kind of directed at the purpose of, you know, if, if knight to a7, uh, now my bishop isn't attacked. That's basically all, all uh, black is trying to say. Because this bishop is important, because again, it controls the key square. You know, the bishop helps the plan, so we have to keep the bishop. Uh, so bishop d7, I actually played a4 before taking on a7. Uh, bishop f8 was played. So this is slowing me down, supporting his weakness, and preparing to you know, advance his plan. Every move with a purpose. Uh, knight takes a7 was played. Uh, rook g7, again, just trying to prepare this so he can play h5 and g4. Uh, now I play a kind of a strange looking move, queen to b3. Uh, so why is this move strange? This should, this should kind of feel not quite right at first glance. Why is that? OK. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so yeah, it kind of looks like it, it doesn't have a purpose. Uh, but it's actually, it looks actively detrimental if you've been cl paying close attention. You're, you're releasing one of the defenders of g4. That's exactly right. I, I'm taking away a defender of the g4 square. So this queen was doing a very important job defending g4. And now it's no longer doing that job. So I had to have a very good purpose to play this move. This is the way that. Uh, you know, you, you really have to you know, think before you play a move like this. Uh, because you know, in chess, it'd be nice if every move we played always followed the plan. But sometimes you, know, you have to deviate from the plan. But when you do do that, you have to be very sure, you know, OK, this move has a distinct purpose with a distinct threat, with a distinct idea that's going to make up for the fact that I'm kind of ignoring uh, my opponent's plan. So with that in mind, uh, thankfully, I did have a distinct purpose. Do you have any idea what it might be? playing this queen b3 idea. This one's pretty tough. So possibly you want to push b5. After the knight loses b5, you can trade. And then you have a possibility of pushing the d-pawn further up. Uh, the the d-pawn further up? Yeah, so yeah. d5 knight, c5 knight take, pawn takes, and at some point you might be able to play pawn g6. Yeah, so you're, you're almost there. You're almost there. Uh, so you've got a good point. Let me ask you, what's the problem uh, with me playing b5 right here? Well, with the queen, with the queen on b3, when once you push b6, you have a discovery on the king. Uh, yeah, so that's true. d6 would come with check, but uh, there's actually a, a very big problem. White would love to play b5 here. This is the most natural move. It follows the plan. You know, it's, it's advancing the pawn. But the problem is knight to c5 is actually just winning. Winning for black. Because I'm going to take this. Uh, he'll recapture. And now, no matter what I play, this knight's going to be taken. Right? My knight's simply stuck. So you're trying, so you're trying to play pawn b6 once that happens? So the point is, after queen b3, uh, if black just follows along with his plan, now what, uh, what idea do I have since my queen is better placed here? Something has changed about that final position that we just saw. I have one extra option. Well, maybe a couple extra options, but one re really good one. Yeah, I don't think I don't think d6 uh, quite makes a difference. The idea I was thinking of was knight takes here, pawn takes, and then actually this knight to c6 move. And I thought this would be very good for me. Uh, so my knight does find an escape, thankfully, and uh, you know I can you know get out of there. Uh, maybe d6 is also working as well. I am not so sure on this one. King h8. Your idea was just to take here. Yeah. Uh, maybe, but my knight's oh, still stuck. Yeah, my knight's. But the other option possibly is go back a move. Okay. Um, 
Is the queen c7 short? Um, take on c7, yeah. queen c7, though. And then we'll, ah, the bishop is here, can I play? We can play pawn b6, but yeah. I don't want to play well, Now I can play b6, after but. Uh, okay, where are we at? This and b6? Yeah. b6 might be working. There might be tactics yeah, here. You you to yeah, you have to be very, very careful, though. <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised if white had some tricky way out of this involving knight c6, but uh, yeah, this might also win as well. But the, you know, black has ideas. So I, I do like this, this knight c6 idea better. Maybe d6 works tactically somehow. I didn't see it. We didn't find it, but I wouldn't be surprised because... But yeah, nice c6 is, is quite nice. So this was my idea. Unfortunately, Julian's not that bad at chess, so he played king h8, simply stepping out of all these ideas. And now for a second I thought, you know, maybe my move isn't so great if black can just, you know, play this one move and, and step out of it. Because I really would like to have my queen here. But uh, there was a, a way I found to, to justify it in the game. So the move I played was a5. And the point is, now with this queen here, I'm supporting uh, this, this b5 push. And uh, then I will actually play b6, now that I have an a pawn to defend it. So here, my opponent made uh, this move, queen to b8. What do you think about this one? Moves away from the strategic idea of setting the queen. Yeah. So already, uh, it's one of those moves that you have to say, wow, this is really, you know, uh, this is anti-positional. Anti this is what we would call anti-positional, because all my ideas are going to be on this king side. I would love if I had my queen ready to, you know, jump into the game. Um, I'm actually blocking my rook off from, you know, coming in further, and I'm actually blocking off my knight's only avenue back to the king side, which maybe that's not going to happen, but it's something to think about. So queen to, queen to b8 is anti-positional, right? It doesn't make any sense uh, regarding black's plan. And because of that, uh, maybe that's part of the reason why tactics actually work out in my favor here. Um, so you have to be very, very careful when you make these anti-positional moves. That's kind of the point of this game. Uh, because you have to be very sure that they come with a purpose and the purpose actually works. <laughs> Because uh, more often than not, when you're moving pieces away from where they should be, you might be thinking you're creating threats, but uh, you're giving your opponent more opportunities as, as well. Uh, with that in mind, what do you think the move is here? Because if I do nothing, he's, he's probably actually going to take this knight, and I'm not going to be so happy about that. So yeah, so b5 is you know the first move that comes to mind. Maybe the only move. Uh, so how does the line go? b5, and then what does what does black want to play there? So let's start with the the easy one. So b5, knight c5. What do we do? This one's not so hard. Yeah, you simply take on c5 and play b6, as, as you said. So uh, yeah, and then I mean, we're going to take this pawn, we're going to crash through on c7, and we're going to win the game, hopefully. So black needs something better than knight c5 after b5. So you're thinking about rook a7. Uh, how does that line possibly go? So b5, rook a7, what are we taking? Mm -hmm. So bishop a7, queen a7 is with check. Uh, uh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, maybe you don't care, though. Maybe you're playing b6. I'm not so sure. But when you're playing b6, you are not playing b takes a6. So. <laughs> that's, that's true. You, you have to understand that if you're playing bishop a7, it's going to be you know, kind of a sacrifice, two pieces for a rook, and you're trying to still break through after that. So b5, rook a7, do we have any other options? Yeah, we can, we can take the knight, right? So b takes a6. What does black play, possibly? Rook takes a6. And then I guess you have some bishop. 
Well, you know, it's it's unclear. So let's let's see what happened in the game. Oh, because oh, because it's it's actually pinned. So if you play knight takes e five, then you're threatening bishop takes e six for three pieces instead of back. Yeah, that's exactly right. So uh, what we were discussing was b five. Rook takes a7 is really the only logical move for black, because obviously we talked about knight c5. B takes a6, regaining the piece. And now you would love to play this move, rook takes a6. But uh, we were talking about a tactic here, which involves knight takes e5. So the point is, if he recaptures, we take here. And the b pawn is pinned to the queen, unfortunately for black. So because of that, uh, Black actually tried to you know, mix things up here, but already, I mean, I can comfortably say Black is losing this game. And uh, there are a couple of reasons for that, but I, the main one is actually just this queen b8 move is simply a, a terrible move. Uh, so again, uh, you know, actually in some of these lines, queen b8 is a move, and queen b8 does work, and you know, there's a line where you know, like white gets something out of it, black gets something out of it. So it might have been an idea that he had seen before. And he was thinking, OK, maybe I'll just play this idea I've seen in this opening, and it'll be fine. But you do have to understand that this is one of those ideas that works under very, very specific circumstances and goes entirely against the point of the opening. So you have to be absolutely certain about your line before you play something like this. It's not something you can just play and think, OK, attack is knight. He has to do something, and then I'll go from there. So this is uh, kind of the next step in strategy, right? You find your plan, and you really want to stick to your plan unless you find a very, very good reason not to. Uh, so yeah, just we can see how the game actually went. b5, rook a7, b a6, that actually happens. Now uh, black tried h5, so he's like kind of realizing, hey, maybe I should stop playing where my opponent's plan is and try to break through on my own. But uh, at this point, it's, it's a bit too late. Uh, in the game, I actually played king h1 because I'm a weak player and I was very, very afraid of being checkmated. But uh, it turns out I can actually just take this rook and uh, be fine with giving up this diagonal. There's actually no real threats for black, which makes sense because he's given up a lot of pieces. Uh, but regardless, king h1, white's still winning. Uh, now he actually does go for this rook takes a6 idea. Uh, I, again, have this knight e7 move, uh, rook to a8. Um, what would be wrong with rook takes a5? Knight takes e7, and after rook takes queen c3. Yeah, so rook a5, knight takes either g6 or d7, actually. I think both yeah, are right. working. Yeah. Um, I like this one because it's check. Rook takes, and now we actually have a nice tactic. So Julian sees this and plays rook a8. Um, here, I had to decide if I wanted his bishop or his knight. In the game, I chose his bishop. Looking back, maybe the knight was the better piece, because, uh, because the knight has a nice square on e5. But uh, regardless, knight takes d7, rook takes d7, rook to b1, simply adding on pressure. And uh, now, unfortunately, Julian made the blunder that kind of ended the game. Uh, he saw this tactic the first time around, but somehow missed it here. Play a rook takes a5, when of course queen c3 is winning the game. And he went on to play for a few more moves, but uh, that part of the game isn't really as important. Uh, so yeah, white went on to win. So any questions about that game? Uh, you know, how black lost, how black ended up losing, and uh, why white was on the winning end? Does all of that kind of make sense? Yeah, strategically it makes sense. Yeah. Um, I'm just curious about some potential, like after, instead of bishop Mm -hmm. To do an exchange sacrifice after like knight takes a7 and then rook takes a7 and then trying to play b6 in some line. Mm -hmm. So instead of, you know, wherever he plays bishop b7, okay. he just so, like, keeps trying to check at you. Yeah, right? so the question is uh, instead of playing bishop to d7, what if black allows knight takes a7 and tries to give up his rook for this knight, right? Uh, so maybe h5 is a natural move. Or, or, or to play, play or, like bishop f8. Yeah. Or, yeah, we'll say bishop of 8, because that's what black ended up doing in the game eventually. Um, so I might play a4 first. Uh, we'll say rook g7. Uh, knight takes a7. Uh, rook a7, bishop a7. Uh, yeah, now you don't have b6, so you have h5. Okay. 
Uh, yeah, so that's part of the reason why you play this a4 move first, is because after b6, uh, you have this, this a5 idea to kind of break out. Uh, I think there's something else wrong with it, but I, it's not coming to mind immediately. So maybe it is just the, this a5 idea. So let's say he doesn't try the b6 stuff anymore because he's throwing in a4. Yep, so, so go. since a5 so is working, so we don't play b6, just h5. Uh, and yeah, so this is going to accelerate your plan a little bit, but the problem is without this knight, it's actually still extremely difficult to, to get g4 in. So I can play something like h3 here. If need be, I can even bring my knight back to f2, although that takes away my bishop's retreat, so I'll, that would kind of be a last resort. Yeah, so maybe maybe Black's future plan is something like knight h8 to f7. But uh, there's actually another problem with giving away the, the rook like this. And uh, the thing is, now my knight isn't stuck on a7. So my plans actually come through a lot more quickly, because I have no knight that you're threatening to take after knight c5. So that means you would have to play like bishop d7 here. So after b5, you can play knight to b8. And uh, this is just going to go very, very poorly for Black, which uh, I don't know. Any move here, queen here, forces like bishop e8, I think. Uh, I'm not entirely sure. But uh, something like this. And you can tell, you know, this is not a move black wants to make. Because again, it takes away from his game plan. And he's further away than ever from uh, achieving this. Question. According to this theory, when you play c5 and he took this knight, is it better to take this knight? Is, or is, is it possible to just continue with the king side altogether? Um, I think you. So I, the overwhelming, yeah, C5? yeah. The overwhelming majority of people do take the pawn on C five okay. after White pushes C five, but I can check the database right now. Uh, I know I usually face Knight C five, but uh, yeah, yeah like maybe game. something like twenty some games people have chosen to ignore yeah. it, and White and <laughs> wins <laughs> all of them. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so. Strategically, uh, that's why this sacrifice happens. You know, it, it kind of slows down White's game plan in a way because you're no longer taking on d6, but it does open up uh, the file for your pieces on the side where you have more space, and it slows down Black's plan. And then eventually, you know, Black uh, kind of blinked first in a way. He said, "Okay, okay, okay. I'm afraid of all your pieces on the queen side. I'll play queen b8. Try to, you know, eject some of them or try to, you know, take some of them." <laughs> Uh, when in fact he, he should have just stuck to his game plan. I think even uh, up to this moment before queen b8, black is actually doing fine here. a5 was actually, I think, a slight technical mistake on, on my part, uh, just because there, there are better ways for, for me to play. I think something like b5 here is actually still quite strong. When something like knight c5, and I uh, don't entirely remember the line, but uh, it goes something like just sacrificing this knight for, free, for a full piece takes and something like uh, b takes or d takes. I want to say d takes. And uh, you know, white's pieces are simply going to be like way too active. And this is going to be pretty good, pretty good for white. So a5 kind of gave him a chance to sneak back in. I'm not sure what the exact best move is. I want to say just h5 is, is going to be OK for, okay for, uh, for black here. Something like b5, knight c5. Knight here, takes b6, takes, takes maybe, and already g4 is coming. So you can see you know, Black's plan would have been vastly accelerated had he just stuck to this. Uh, his queen can still come in to h4 or g5. His knight can jump into to h4 uh, or f4. And uh, yeah, so this is kind of how Black should have played, in my opinion. And if he had done this, you know, it would have been an equal game still, because neither of us had really given up on our plans yet. Uh, with that in mind, I want to look at this game uh, between two 2400s, which we're going to look at it from the black side, actually. And we're going to see what happens when you know white's kind of the one who blinks first, the one who makes the first mistake. So d4, knight of 6, c4, uh, g6. It's the same line in the king's Indian, actually. Uh, we have the, these same moves, uh, still knight to d7. Again, knight e8 is another, another line. And it actually makes a lot of sense, this 98 line, uh, thinking about this game we just looked at specifically. Uh, and why do you think is that? Why does this make a lot of sense, considering what we just saw? Yeah. 
I mean, like, what was all my play centered around last game? Well, yeah, the c5 break, but then once I sacrificed the c pawn, it, it was on c7, right? That's where all my you know, counterattacks were coming from. That's why he had to bring his knight to a6. So the idea with this knight e8 move is kind of just, I'm going to defend c7 and d6. You can open it up with c5, but you're not going to have as much counterplay on that square specifically. Uh, but knight to d7 was played instead in this game. Bishop e3, f5, f3, f4, bishop f2, rook c1, knight g6. It's actually the exact same position. Knight takes, b4, knight a6, uh, knight d3, rook f7, knight b5, bishop d7, a4, and h5. So this is the first deviation from last game. Uh, in the last game, black played bishop f8 with the idea of rook to g7, which is a fine idea. Uh, black simply chose to play h5 first in, in this case. Uh, so again, white captured the pawn, as I did in my game. Uh, now we see bishop to h6. So this is a different kind of way of organizing the black pieces. Maybe it makes actually slightly more sense than the other game. Uh, why do you think that is? Why, why do I say maybe the bishop makes more sense on h6 than on f8? Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's exactly the point. Um, bishop f8 is more kind of trying to stop uh, white's plan approach. You know, it defends this d6 pawn. But in the last game, we saw that d6 wasn't ever really the problem, right? The problems all came, you know, on, on b7 and c7. So maybe it makes more sense to put this bishop somewhere where it can create threats, like you said. So after something like g4, if uh, the f pawn were ever to move, we could play f3, and there are threats on the rook, threats on you know the diagonal possibly. And uh, the bishop can actually serve an, an active purpose. Uh, white played rook to c3. And this is the first move that was kind of dubious. Uh, it's been played before, but uh, this move doesn't make as much sense as some other ones. So why do you think white played it? To stop what we just talked about, so that white can actually take on g4 now, if black plays um, g4. Yeah, it's a little bit deeper than just stepping out of this discovered attack. Well, it also puts pressure on c7. It puts, so you can yeah. Potential but why this square spe specifically? Why not rook c4, rook c2, or why rook c3? Well, after rook c2, it's harder to triple up if you want to triple up. Also, it's longer to count. Uh, right, okay. Yeah, so rook c2 would be a mistake, right? <laughs> But uh, okay, I mean, rook c rook c four is. <laughs> yeah, you got me, you got me. But okay, rook c four would be you know another try. Why rook c three instead of rook c four? Uh, when c four, sometimes there could be lines when we want our bishop on e two to do something on the queen side. It's harder to do that now. That's fair. That's fair. Okay, maybe c three makes the most sense for a lot of reasons. But uh, the idea I was trying to get at is he's trying to stop Black's counterplay okay. using the this third reg defense. This is a term that gets used sometimes. Uh, so maybe eventually someday, obviously not right now, black's going to try to play like something like f3, and white would like to bring the rook over. <coughs> obviously this line is like nonsense, but this is kind of a deep point. Uh, but the thing is, uh, it's actually kind of, a, kind of a slow way to play. Uh, so instead of rook c3, uh, what else do you think white could have tried? <laughs> yeah, so a5 makes some sense. a5 makes some sense. But there's actually a, a problem with a5. Yeah, queen b8's good. <laughs> b5, rook a7, b a6, rook a6. Now if knight e5? Oh, yeah, the point is oh, there's no pin in the end. end. That's right. Yeah. So that, that was yeah. critical for, for this tactic to work. Uh, but instead, there's this other idea. And this actually stems from the bishop not being on f8. Uh, this stems from the bishop being on h6 instead. I'm kind of giving it away with my notation. That's good. That's good. <laughs> so yeah, how were things different with the bishop on f8 now that the bishop's on h6? It's the most natural move for white to want to play here. 
Well, depending on how you look at it. <laughs> might, it might be completely unnatural to you. I, I have no way of knowing, but. Yeah, right? I mean, this knight looks dumb. I want to poke at it, so I want to play b5. <laughs> and now that the bishop is on f8, after knight c5, we can take, 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 and uh, our knight's defended. And after something like b6, what would happen? Tough, right? Well, we can possibly still go to c6, and the point is, he can take, oh, take, like take bishop the bishop with the bishop c1 line, right? Yeah, there's, there's bishop c4 in the end. So it's like this other line that I briefly mentioned in the last game. We play knight to c6. Uh, if black wants to win the piece, he has to capture. Uh, now d takes. We can insert this if we want. We don't have to. And at the end, we're going to play bishop c4. And uh, this is actually going to be, like I think, crushing for white if this line actually happens. Uh, so because of that, um, because of that, black should play something different here than b6. Okay, so b6. So king g7. Yeah, I guess. Um, yeah, simply takes. Check. I'll take this. That's a lot of points. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's not it's not great. Yeah, you might get this a four pawn, and maybe I have to keep this rook on the back rank for fear. Those pawns are, yeah, oh, really? yeah, maybe actually rook to b one here is most accurate, just uh, stopping your rook from coming in. And yeah, I mean it's plus eight, plus nine, plus yeah. <laughs> so yeah, this line isn't so good, uh, and I might have given it away on the board for half a second if you're paying close attention. But uh, what should black play here instead of b6? So my idea is just to, con uh, just to continue working on the, on the king side. Mm -hmm. Just g4. Yeah, just g4 right away. And that's exactly right. And uh, the line might go something like d6, trying to open up the same bishop c4 tactic. Uh, c takes d, queen takes d. And uh, yeah, now this would actually be a very, very interesting game. I'm not entirely sure who's better here. I don't <laughs> completely remember. The details of this line, but uh, I wish I had a I just don't want to play this position. Oh, okay. <laughs> I, mean, I don't either. I just, yeah, I mean, what you were I, more scared, about. scared for everybody I involved. I don't want to be white, but I would rather not play it at all. <laughs> that's fair. That's fair. So, uh, I, I think it's, yeah, it's, it's, yeah, white side's about white's always it's plus point 0.5. <laughs> I mean, what, what can you do? No. It's the king's Indian, white's always right. plus point 0.5, but uh. So yeah, uh, again, the key is not to uh, start trying to just play on the opposite side of the board, trying to stop your opponent. Uh, you want to be making moves that advance your plan. And that's why g4 is the correct move here. Uh, so that was a bit of a side tangent, however, because uh, white didn't play b5. That's what he should have done. Instead, he played rook to c3, uh, which is you know kind of a slower move. Uh, this allows black simply just to play rook g7. Uh, knight to b5. Uh, what was wrong with this move now after rook g7? Let's not spend too much time again, but. Uh... Any ideas? Any ideas? <laughs> <laughs> so the, the key is. In the line we looked at, there wouldn't be bishop c4 pinning the rook anymore. It would simply be check and black would move. And then black has more compensation for, uh, for the piece. Well, for the pawns. Uh, so instead we see knight b5, trying to extract the knight. Knight to f8, uh, preparing you know, this idea, preparing this idea. Uh, we see h3, uh, trying to prevent black's plan. Knight h7. Uh, bishop e1. So white is fully committing to trying to defend against this g4 break. Uh, the point of this move is just to give the knight f2. But again, you see white's progress is really slowed down on the queen's side. It's starting to look like, you know, is white ever actually going to make a threat on the queen's side, or is he just going to 
try to stop g4 for the rest of the game, when, of course, you know, black eventually plays it as a sacrifice and, and can break through. So we see g4, takes, 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 and knight g5. So this is a thematic idea, is putting this knight on g5 behind this g4 break. It attacks the newly weakened uh, e-pawn, and it prepares something like f3, as well as you know, numerous other, other ideas. Uh, we see rook to c4, and this is kind of, uh, kind of the, the final straw, right? You know, white played rook to c3 earlier instead of rook to c4, and now he's making this second move, uh, seemingly wasting just a, an entire tempo, right? Which is something you don't especially want to do in the King's Indian. It, it can lead to some disasters. Uh, so rook to h7 was played, getting on this open file, getting ready to create some threats. Uh, so once again, uh, black has completed his pawn break. So this is kind of the next step, which we didn't really see the next step in the previous game because it ended rather quickly to a tactic. But uh, once you've opened up uh, the side where you have more space, once you've completed your pawn break, uh, this is where you, know, you try to just activate your pieces. And so what does that mean? That just means placing them on even forward squares, like this g5 square, attacking the weaknesses that you've made because you have more space, and uh, making threats. Uh, so this is kind of where uh, you, you start breaking through. You start uh, creating threats, trying to win the game. And this is where your tactics are going to start popping up. We see knight to f2, uh, holding on. <laughs> Queen f6, again, he's just bringing his pieces over. Uh, to where he's, he's opened the board. Queen to b3. Maybe he could have tried to take this, but I somehow don't believe in it at all. <laughs> uh, bishop f8, preparing to checkmate the white king. Bishop d2. Based on the problem behind taking, um, taking this is seven, um, black takes, white takes, something, black gets bishop a4. Something like bishop g4, bishop a4. Yeah, yeah I guess bishop a4. Yeah, so takes here, fails tactically uh, to something like this. Um, yeah, so maybe there's something better. Uh, maybe this is actually OK. But yeah, as I said, once you've broken through, that's when these tactics start occurring, because your opponent's going to have to you know, make, have some loose pieces, have some undefended pieces, and your pieces are going to get active, because you're playing where you have more space, so your pieces will just naturally have more squares to go to, they'll be more active. But uh, OK, let's, I don't know, if, if we really want to solve the mystery here, can ask. So yeah, it's, it's takes first, or no, nope, knight c7, rook c7, bishop a4, queen c1, uh, and simply f3, breaking, breaking through. Uh, because also the bishop is now pointing to king. Yeah, also this bishop is now useful, right? <laughs> so OK. So obviously white can't take, queen to b3. Let's turn that off. Uh, bishop to f8, we already saw this. Bishop d2. Uh, simply bishop to e7. Uh, this move, I don't immediately see the purpose, actually. Maybe the points you can play king g7 bring the second rook to h8. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. You can, you can bring this other rook in, or maybe you can bring this rook to f8, depending on the line. But OK, it's fine. Rook to c1, we now see queen h6. Uh, king f1, trying to avoid checkmate. Queen into h2, already you can see, you know, black's pieces are just simply more active, and so there are going to be tactics, and white's king is, is going to fall. Rook 1 to c3, rook f8, bishop f3, preventing the f3 pawn break. Uh, now queen g3, bishop e1. Uh, rook to h2, so threatening to capture here possibly, and then capture here. Uh, what would happen on something like knight d3, quickly? Let's look. I don't know if there's a, an immediate one, actually, at first glance. It felt like there should be, but uh, I don't know. The move I kind of want to play is knight takes f3, but it looks a little bit absurd, like a little bit too much. Well, the 
worst case scenario, we can just play rook h1 and save the queen, then you have a square. Yeah, simply maybe queen h2 here is, is enough. And you're going to take this next turn, and there will be like rook f1 stuff, and king queen g2 stuff, and yeah, OK. But uh, yeah, so bishop d8, uh, he simply defends the c pawn uh, in spite of everything going on. But uh, this move is actually kind of inaccurate, believe it or not, because you know black should just break through. It doesn't matter though. Either way, uh, you know black is winning. We see rook to a3, rook f6, bringing in the last rook, rook c2, rook h6, rook c1, and, and now knight takes b4, and uh, this is kind of the, the the final breakthrough. We can just simply take this pawn because after bishop takes, uh, after bishop takes, we have rook h1. Rook h1 and rook d1, and this is more than enough. So instead, we saw knight c7, rook h1 check anyways, check, queen h2, and now white simply gives up his queen. And the game ended pretty quickly after. Reasonably quickly after. <laughs> okay, and yeah, here white went ahead and resigned. It's Totally winning for black in this end game. These pawns are simply too much. Uh, so yeah, any questions about what went wrong in this game? This one I think was even maybe more clear, because white kind of just wasted some time, right? He didn't play moves that advanced his plan, and he didn't like rook c3. Maybe you can argue it was aimed at you know slowing down black, but in the end it, it didn't really do anything at all. Uh, but yeah, any questions though? Any questions about this one? All right, so just to do a quick recap. Uh, so there are a few different types of pawn centers. Today we were looking at closed centers. In closed centers, what you want to do is you want to play on the side where you have more space, and you want to play for a pawn breakthrough on that side. In the King's Indian, which is what we looked at today, you want to play this c5 move as white and this f5, f4, g4 break uh, as black. And when you're following through on these plans, it's very important to play every move with a very specific purpose aimed at furthering the plan. If a move doesn't further the plan, you better be very, very sure that it's a good move or else you'll find yourself in trouble, which is what happened in these games. Uh, other than that, thanks for coming out. Uh, thanks for joining me on YouTube if you're watching uh, watching this online, and I'll see you next time.